Welcome to the Business of Story, where we connect you with the leading minds in the art of business storytelling. Learn from best-selling authors, Hollywood screenwriters, makers, content marketers, and brand raconteurs on how to craft and sell compelling stories that sell. The Business of Story is brought to you by Oracle Marketing Cloud, helping businesses use the latest marketing technologies to tell their stories and connect with their customers. Emma, which provides innovative email marketing tools and services that drive brilliant results. Act Content Management Software, organizing all your prospect details in one place so you can prioritize your day and market more effectively. And by Convince and Convert, digital marketing advisors and counselors to leading brands and organizations worldwide. Convince and Convert helps you gain and keep your customers online. Here's your host, Park Howell. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Business of Story. My name is Park Howell, and I am here, as you know, to connect you with the brilliant story minds from around the world to help teach us how to craft and tell compelling stories to move our brands forward, to drive our content marketing, to connect with our employees and have them pulling all in the same direction, to help us understand and communicate with our shareholders, or to take our new enterprise to investors and share stories with them to get them to invest to help us move our missions further faster. That's what storytelling does. And today we have a command performance, actually, the legendary screenwriting coach, Robert McKee, who has been doing this in Hollywood and around the world for more than 40 years, teaching some of the top minds how to write, draft uh, fantastic screenplays and movies. He's got a number of Academy Award winners that have been through his program. Uh, he is just an amazing individual, a very very much of a tour de force, um, and he's on our show today. It's great to have him back. He was one of our first guests that helped me launch Business of Story back in July. And uh, they reached out, wanted to come back on the show, and I couldn't be more tickled to have Robert McKee with us today. Before we jump into our interview, I want to do something for you all, but I've got to ask you to do something for me if that's totally cool. You know how it is in the podcast world. We are trying to get as much audience as possible to share our voice around the world. So if you would do me a favor... Go to iTunes, even right now if you would. Uh, Give me a ranking on the show if you've been a listener, a long-time listener, and haven't done so yet. Uh, Please star my show and let me know what works for you. And what I'm going to do is the next 10 people that do that, I will draw a name out of the next 10 to go to iTunes and give me a ranking on the show and a comment on the show. I'll draw a name out, uh, reach out to you, and uh, give you a one-hour free story consultation. We can do this by phone. We can do it by Skype. We can do it in person. If you happen to be in Phoenix, Arizona, would love to sit down with you and offer a free one-hour story consultation, business of story principles for you in your effort. If you would do me just the big huge of going to iTunes and giving me a rank on the show and rate it and of course, share it with your world. And uh, while you're doing all that, if you are looking for some more storytelling tools or the ways to really make this work in your life, please visit businessofstory.com. I have just a ton of information there. Everything that has informed my journey, which by the way is a euphemism that Robert McKee is not crazy about, journey, but all the materials that have informed my journey for the past 10 years and understanding what Hollywood knows and what great authors and screenwriters know about story that we can all use in our lives, in our everyday business, professional, and personal lives is found on Business of Story. In our library section, I share it through my blog and, of course, in the podcast. And you will find a number of free tools there that you can download and use right away, too. So that's it for me, for Business of Story. My big plea to you to go online and give me a ranking and move forward. Um, But now, without further ado, let me bring back in now who I would call my friend, very much of a mentor, a tour de force, Robert McKee. Well, Robert, it is great to have you back on Business of Story. Thanks for joining us today. And always my pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, we first got acquainted uh, several years ago, 2010, I think it was, and I had the privilege of sitting in your four-day story workshop. I think it was at the LA Sheridan, LAX Sheridan, and I was blown away. It was really my first introduction into Hollywood in that sense, where you were talking to, I think, a room full of about 200 screenwriting wannabes, and you took us through... Um, four days of uh, the the baton death march of information. I mean, it was amazing. 
the amount of information that you put into that, I think they were like eight hour days. And one of my all time favorite memories, I think, in my career is when you took us on the last day through Casablanca. And you oh, took yeah. us scene by scene through Casablanca, what was happening, what the screenwriter was setting up, the subtext to all that. Uh, it was just a really amazing time. So it's just an honor to have you back on Business of Story. And can you give our listeners a little bit more context about your run in Hollywood and, and, and where you find yourself today as really the legendary screenwriting coach and story doctor? Well, we're going back... <laughs> at least 40 years. Um, After grad school, I came out to Hollywood and I was a busy uh, screenwriter, television writer, and sold a lot of screenplays or optioned them more properly. Um, But uh, for various reasons, screenplays where they they pay an option fee, but um, they don't get made because they couldn't raise the financing, the casting, the new, whatever. So those uh, languished. I was in what was called um, development hell for most of that time. But um, the television programs that I wrote, like um, I wrote the uh, four-hour film for TV, Abraham, with uh, Richard Harris and uh, Barbara Hershey, Maximilian Schell, uh, directed by the great uh, uh, Fred uh, 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 as uh, Joseph Sargent, um, those all got made, all the TV episodes, all the crime stories. Uh, so um, I was in that uh, place where I was getting, uh, making a living as a writing, as a writer, writing TV and optioning screenplays, waiting for one of my screenplays to get to the screen. And I got invited uh, to, um, to a, pl- a school, a private school called uh, Sherwood Oaks Experimental College. Uh, and the, um, the premise there was it was going to be a film school where only professionals taught. And, and so it was wildly successful for a bit. Uh, Joseph, um, I'm sorry, uh, Sidney Pollack was teaching uh, directing. Dustin Hoffman was teaching acting. I mean, this guy was very popular. And um, I did the Saturday morning workshop for writers from just 9 to 12. And it was great. Uh, and I did it for eight weeks, and um, I put together little lectures and uh, little workshops, and fine. And then I got a phone call: Would I come back and do it again? And so I went back, and this time, instead of there being twenty-five people, there was like a hundred people. And so the, it all became more lecture now than workshop. I did it for another eight Saturdays, and then I they asked if I'd do it again. And this time, when I came back the third time, they'd rented a theater because <laughs> there were like 300 people there. And I realized that these lectures really, to me, was sort of like common sense. But to other people, not. To other people, this was a revelation. Uh, and then I got invited by Women in Film uh, to bring these lectures to New York City. I got invited by International Forum uh, to bring the lectures to Europe. And they just sort of took over my life. Uh, and as a result, I've had, I, don't, I forget the last count as of the last Oscars, uh, but uh, it's something like uh, 65 of my students have won Oscars. A couple hundred or more have won Emmys. There's been Pulitzer Prize uh, writers, journalists, book writers winning uh, the Booker Prize, uh, and uh, on it goes. And so, um, and so I brought out a book. Uh, as a result of these lectures uh, entitled Story, Substance, Structure, Style, and the Principles of Screenwriting that's been in the upper 1% of all books sold at Amazon.com for the last 20 years. And, and I continue to travel the world every spring and fall. I w- we literally go around the world. Uh, this, um, this spring will be London, be in China, the fall it's at Paris, et cetera. We just, it just um, become a huge enterprise uh, and never, it can't seem to kill this thing with a stick because um, the demand never lets, never lets up. And so um, I do as many of these as I, as I physically can, uh, probably about 12 major lectures a year and a lot of, and then I do a lot of consultations with um, private corporations 
and uh, at various institutions of um, different kinds uh, to um, help them uh, tell story in an effective way to to market uh, for inwardly and in, in terms of um, a leadership. Uh, and so it's um, it's it amazes me because I never planned any of this, uh, but um, somehow the need to understand the essence and elements of story and be able to use them in expressing uh, your ideas and in persuading people in particular in the business context. Um, the, the story is the key to the art of persuasion. If you want to influence people toward becoming a, you know, a customer, a, a client, an investor, whatever, um, the best way in which to uh, put your ideas forward in an effective way that will activate people is in story, story's form, story structure, rather than rhetoric. And so um, my clients have uh, been as successful as my Oscar winners in the private sphere. Well, in speaking of Oscar winners in Hollywood and so forth, one of the first places I saw you, or actually in, uh, Brian Cox playing you, was in Charlie Kaufman's adaptation. Yeah. And uh, you have, to, or he has a wonderful scene in there that, to me, anyways, after visiting and experiencing story, I thought was pretty accurate. How did that come about that they had Brian Cox playing the great Robert McKee in adaptation, teaching Nicolas Cage, the, you know, the screenwriter, what it means to put story together? Uh, I got a phone call one day in the middle of the day from a producer in New York, uh, uh, Ed Saxon. And Ed said, he said, this is the most uh, embarrassing phone call I've ever had to make. <laughs> We've got this uh, crazy writer, Charlie Kaufman. He's written a screenplay. He's, um, he's made you a character in it. He has freely quoted from your book uh, without permission, from your lectures without uh, permission. And uh, we don't know what to do. And I said, well, send me a copy. And I'll see what. And I read it, and I could see what he was up to. He wanted me to be the the force that he would have to push against. That I represent uh, Hollywood on one hand, and um, and uh, a kind of a traditional storytelling on the other. And uh, and the Charlie Kaufman character in the film is trying to do something radical, something exceptional, and that violates. Uh, he thinks these um, these. Uh, what he would think as a rule, which is nonsense. Of course, there are no rules in writing. And, um, and so, um, uh, and I, so I called Ed and I said, you know, I, I, I understand he wants me to be a bit of a villain against his, um, you know, uh, sad little artist. And I'm going to be the, the heavy, which is fine by me <laughs> because <laughs> you play that pretty well, by yeah, the way, I know. The it's yeah. fine by me because, um, um, I don't tolerate fools. And um, and the, the romantics who think that writing is just sitting there and the, the muse descends into you and your arm begins to move automatically and it's all it's instinct to went out are, are really fools. And they don't, you know, they just they're just naive and it's really silly. Um, you know, they, they, you can no more write like that than you could co compose music that way or um, or paint that way. And so. Um, uh I said, okay, I, I'll be a character in your film under two conditions. One, I get a redeeming scene. Two, I have control of the casting. And they agree to that. And so um, they wrote uh, the redeeming scene where Charlie Kaufman and, uh, and McKee sit down in a bar. And I you know, sort of put my hand on the guy's shoulder and I say, you know, look, you know, it's, it's flawed up till now, but your story hasn't got an ending. And so you create a great ending and all will be forgiven. And then um, as to the casting, I, um, I cast my friend uh, Brian Cox because uh, I knew that Brian would do me very well, and I think he did, he did me perfectly. Oh, it's and, great. And for anybody yeah. that wants to see it, just go to YouTube and search uh, Robert McKean adaptation, and you'll see that quick scene. It's wonderful. You, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, but the, the film only works halfway. It's good. It's fine. But um, 
there comes a moment in the in the and I told the the Spike Lee and the and Spike Jones rather and the um, and Charlie that there will be a parting of the waves um, at the point where uh, Meryl Streep's character says we're going to have to go kill him. Uh, half of the audience will believe that, half of them won't, and um, and which is about what happens. And so it's not a, a hundred percent satisfying film for everyone, I must say, but but most people enjoy it, I think. And they, even the ones who don't b- believe that Meryl Streep's character Susan Orleans would um, would actually commit murder, um, they laugh when she does or tries to. So and so it gets it becomes comic. Mm. It's okay, and um, but the film was very successful, and uh, I was very pleased with it. Yeah, I love it. I've seen it several times now, and uh, I refer to that clip in you with you in there quite a bit. I just I thought it captured you very very well. So l- let me ask you: in all these years, you've worked with screenwriters to get them you know, to perfect their craft. Um, how do you, what similarities do you see in screenwriters and either business leaders or business communicators that? Uh, what you know works in Hollywood uh, works over in the business realm in communication. Well, at the very heart of it all um, is a, a matter uh, for both the artist and for the business person of learning to think in a very uh, special in a form of logic. Uh, business people have a, a problem often uh, which is that they they present their ideas in inductive logic, uh, which they were taught in school. When you write an essay, you were taught to come up with a, a, a thesis statement in the first paragraph. Then you build a case point by point, paragraph by paragraph, with statistics, with appeals to authority, and so forth. And then at the bottom of the essay, you have a paragraph of conclusion, and therefore – and presumably you have proved your point. Uh, this is rhetoric, uh, the use of data of various kinds to build a case to prove your point. And this is the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, this is how business operates. And um, what they discover is that uh, in trying to prove your point, the people to whom you're offering this proof have their own evidence, they have their own statistics, they have their own authorities, and they sit there while you're giving a PowerPoint presentation arguing with you. No, that's not the numbers, that's not how it works, that's not how things happen, whatever. Um, And so your ability to prove your point inductively is iffy at best, Um, and because, as I said, people resist, or even if they agree with your uh, point, they don't remember it because it just doesn't fit the mind. Rhetoric is not the way the mind works. And, um, and so, um, uh, they just, uh, even if you give them a sheet of data, um, at the meeting, perhaps they crumple that up and throw it away because people don't want their heads cluttered with all that data. They got Google. Robert, and is that the roots of this kind of presentation, this inductive reasoning rhetoric? To yeah. me, it seems like it dates way back to even the industrial age. I mean, it's that oh, old, yeah. but it's just the way we mechanically try to put business together. This is the way people have been taught, politicians and business people have been taught to communicate with each other since the Greeks and the Romans. I well, mean, this a, literally- a great story about a... a, a, a uh, memo that was sent down uh, the river, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Going back to that now, you just sparked that in my mind. Can you yeah, share yeah. that yeah. It's a, with it's us? It's a wonderful archaeological story. Um, ancient Egypt was the essence of bureaucracy. It was just like one huge corporation with layer upon layer, pyramid of pyramids of power, and um, it was a terrible bureaucracy. And uh, archaeologists excavating a site found a memo, a piece of papyra wrapped up that had not been opened. Okay. And when they opened it and read it, it was from an administrator in Thebes to a clerk down somewhere uh, up, up the Nile somewhere. And the essence of the memo was you never respond to my memos. <laughs> 
I send you these memos and you never, ever respond. <laughs> and of course, the thing hadn't even been opened. Uh, so this is, you know, this is how long, you know, this sort of thing has gone on. Is, I guess it's the onset of the plague about that time. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> Don't respond to my memos. Um, and so what I teach business people is how to communicate with the most uh, power, the most effect, and how to motivate people to take actions. So you take the same data that would be in a PowerPoint presentation, but rather than organizing it with inductive logic, building a case to a point, to a proof, you incorporate that data into a beautiful, beautifully told story, what I call the purpose-told story. It's not a fiction. It's a, a faction. I do not teach business people to use myths and legends and uh, fairy tales and uh, all that stuff, okay? I've, I find all of that really tedious. I mean, there, it's not as if the, you know, the, the myth of Sisyphus isn't a metaphor for what it is to be in business, but to teach people that business is like rolling a rock up a hill uh, endlessly is, is kind of pointless. We all you know, get that. And so I promote uh, the use of fact, fact-based storytelling in business and incorporate the data, that fact, into a beautifully told story that hooks people's attention, holds them in high suspense, holds their attention, and then rewards them for paying attention with a satisfying experience, both mentally and emotionally, that then activates them to, to do something that you want them to do, to purchase your product, to hire your service, uh, or even if it's, a, if it's a branding exercise, to tell them a story that simply makes them aware of your ba ba brand and puts it into a positive glow uh, so that they have a, a positive awareness of the brand that will influence their, their purchases and behaviors in the future. And so by, by shifting from inductive logic to causal logic, stories are logical, but they are not inductively logical. They are causally logical. They are the logic of how an, eff a, a, an effect <clears throat> becomes a cause, how that cause then becomes another effect that triggers yet another cause, how that cause creates an effect that becomes another cause, and on it goes. The interconnectedness of life on all levels cause and effect that comes to a, a, a powerful, effective conclusion that moves people to a, a profitable action for the company. And storytelling, I have to you know, point out, is more difficult than rhetoric. I mean, one of the reasons why business people don't you know, immediately and constantly use storytelling in their business is because it requires more work. I mean, you know, you, you've been doing deductive logic ever since you were in junior high school. They taught you how to write an essay, you know, in the, in the seventh, eighth grade. And what is a PowerPoint presentation most of the time? It's simply a junior high school essay with special effects. And so it's, it's something you, you've always done since you were a kid, assembling ideas in a rational way to prove a point. Um, it's easy requires work. You have to gather the evidence and compose it and, and, and put it up there on the, on the PowerPoint presentation and, and choose your fonts. But that is, um, that is not the way to get people to really believe and go, wow, and, uh, and, uh, and take action. Okay, right there. Perfect place to take a break for our sponsors to tell their stories, because when we come back, Robert, I want to learn more, share with our listeners about Storynomics and how you teach them to uh, you know, really use story to get people to pay attention, connect emotionally, and move them to action. So let's cover that when we get back right after these messages. Improve your odds of winning new business with ACT, the number one best-selling customer and contact managing system in the world. Individuals, small businesses, and sales teams the world over trust ACT to help them organize customer and lead details, send emails, market products and services more effectively, and ultimately 
drive sales, whether they're in the office or on the road. Discover how ACT can help you by signing up for your free trial today at actstory.com. Hey, I've got a question for you. What's the best call to action button color on your website? Yeah, you probably didn't see that one coming, did you? Well, what's the best shape and sizes of your CTA buttons? And what copy gets more clicks? You know, these questions have interrupted my sleep patterns for weeks now until I downloaded a helpful new email marketing guide from Emma called Why We Click, The Psychology Behind a Great Call to Action. You'll learn how applying just a little bit of brain science can transform your CTA buttons into small but mighty conversion powerhouses. It covers the button color, copy, and placement that helps skyrocket click rates. Check it out at myemma.com forward slash click. You know, Emma helps marketers everywhere send smart, stylish email newsletters, promotions, and automated campaigns, and to help us all rest a little easier knowing our email marketing is doing its job. So check out their new publication at myemma.com forward slash click. Welcome back to Business of Story and a command performance from Robert McKee, the legendary screenwriting coach who was kind enough to join me when we first started Business of Story last summer. He was one of our first guests, and it's just so wonderful to have you back on the show today, especially since you said earlier that you don't tolerate fools. So therefore, I guess I'm not in the fool category. No, you're not. <laughs> Well, I'm fascinated by story, storytelling. Um, our son went to film school at Chapman University, and he's a motion graphics artist in downtown Hollywood, and he's been doing that for a number of years. He wrote his first film. He went to you know, your story workshop with me. He went as a screenwriter wannabe, and I went as a business wannabe of understanding how to use it in our line of work. And I'll tell you, Robert, he uh, uses your book, and he goes back to his notes time and time again. He's written his film. He has a co-writer, a very, very talented young lady that's working with him. They shot a, a sizzle reel out in East Jesus, a commune out on the Salton Sea. He ran Maybe. it over to Cannes, France this time last year, you know, running it around, shopping it around, got a lot of input from a lot of different, you know, producers. And now they're in the rewriting uh, realm of the whole thing. So I'm very, very proud of him. He's a 28-year-old, hardworking director, you know, wannabe, and he's doing all the right things. And it's just like you said, he's not waiting for a muse to come down and make it happen. He just has his sleeves rolled up. He's working hard at it. And and I want to thank you because you've had a lot of impact on him, both from your story uh, workshop that we attended and your book. And he refers to you quite a bit. So thank well, you for that. Well, it, you tell him there's a new book coming out uh, in July entitled Dialogue. Ah. The Art of Verbal Action for Page, Stage, and Screen. And so I've written out the, the companion to story uh, on dialogue. And, um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a multimedia. It's for, for novelists, playwrights, uh, television, of course, and, uh, and film. And, um, and he might be at that stage in his project where He's got to give final consideration to the shaping of dialogue. So it'll come out in uh, July. So he should oh. keep an eye out for that. Uh, he definitely will. I'll let him know. I don't know if he r routinely listens to his old man's podcast or not, but uh, he's coming over to Phoenix this weekend to do some shooting for business of story for me. So it'll be fun. To, and I'll definitely right. mention that to him. Yeah. But moving on to Storynomics and the work now that you have evolved into in teaching business leaders and communicators how to use story. And I attended one of your first Storynomics a couple of years ago, again, over in Los Angeles. And I know that program has grown quite a bit. Can you tell us a little bit about that mm. program and what do you teach us? Give us a few tips on how we can move audiences to action. Well, I start out by... Uh, looking at the three fundamental techniques of persuasion, uh, emotional persuasion, rational persuasion, and then the combination of emotion and ration, rational persuasion, which is story. And so in, in advertising, uh, for example, most advertising is emotional uh, persuasion. Uh, it's a, it's either bragging or promising or both. We're the biggest, we're the best, we're the newest. Uh, we're going to do this for you. We're going to do that for you. You're going to love us. Um, and so it tries to um, to use um, seduction and making all kinds of promises and 
and compliments. Occasionally, especially like when we see um, uh, political advertising, if they use the opposite. They they use coercion. Their emotional approach is to frighten you, uh, to make you angry, and so forth. And they and so they make another kind of list. This is a terrible danger. Uh, this person is an awful person. Whatever. And so, but that's emotion. It's either seduction or coercion, um, and that those those two are, are fundamental to advertising. Uh, and then, of course, there's as I mentioned, rhetoric, which is the rational persuasion by by inductive logic by building a case into a proof. Then the third method is story, which combines meaning and emotion. And so the the meaning is created out of the the dynamic of change, cause and effect, charged with a a value, and the emotion is caused uh, by empathy, by telling a story in such a way that the audience at some level, even unconsciously, feels that it's as if it's happening to them. They involve themselves emotionally in the story because it resonates with their own life. And as a result, um, they are uh, with a positive ending, and all business stories naturally have a positive ending. The positive ending inspires them to take the action that the storyteller wants them to take. And so I lay out those three choices, and, um, uh, and, uh, and I'm not condemning emotion pure and simple in advertising or rhetoric in business. Those things have their place and whatever works, you know, if it works, it works. Uh, But what I try to get business people to do is to to merge meaning and emotion and to uh, put it together into a story form. Um, And I, I teach it in two directions, taking it outward into the world in terms of uh, marketing and all the dimensions of marketing, branding, advertising, sales, um, and then inward into the company in in terms of the use of story and leadership to communicate with your employees or employers up and down uh, the corporation in story form. um, And uh, in order to make sense to people, in a way that will change their behavior and bring about some harmony, and mutual understanding, and teamwork uh, inside of a inside of a corporation. And so I teach it outwardly and um, inwardly, and and uh, people tell me as they begin to master this form and put it to work in either direction that they have great success. My clients that I work uh, you know, face-to-face with individually outside of the seminar uh, have become very successful in, in their adaptation of stories. It's been very profitable for them. So l- let me ask you, uh, you've got outward and inward. Who do you think is doing a pretty good job with their outward business storytelling through the branding, <laughs> marketing, and so forth, whether it's a client of yours or not, someone else you're seeing? Who do you think is doing a pretty good job right now? Oh, well, you see um, Red Bull, is um, is really t- done extremely well with their storytelling. Um, occasionally, um, someone like IBM will get it right, but uh, but IBM makes as many bad uh, pieces of um, branding. Siemens is very good at it. The Siemens Answers campaign has been extremely successful, um, and so occasionally there are there are companies that. Um, uh, Starbucks, excellent. Um, so, so occasionally there are companies like that. <laughs> well, that, let me ask you about it, Red Bull. It, though. It, 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 it's not. I wonder if it's an accident. The two coffee companies are very. <laughs> <laughs> well, Red Bull, you know, their storytelling is they get a bunch of lunatic youngsters out there willing to kill themselves, and then they film them, mm. um, and then we all get to live vicariously through their feet. So that is really terrific visual storytelling, and it certainly. Uh, it worked with the brand of we give you wings, you know, uh, yep. it, the yep. caffeine. And yet when it comes right down to it, if you are trying to own that audience through a crafted story, um, I, I don't that, think of them that, in that light. I think of them yeah. as an event or a spectacular. No, not no, as no, no, no. But you have to learn. No, no, you're wrong. Hal. Okay. It's not. It's a perfectly crafted story. 
Um, you think it's just, you know, that's that's the magic of such a thing. You think it's just an impression, a bunch of kids having uh, uh, high wire adventures. Um, what I part of what I teach uh, business is the difference between the implicit and the explicit story. Is uh, Red Bull an explicit story? No, it's an implicit story. Um, for example, do you remember? I mean, you don't need. You don't need words. You just right. need it. Do you remember the the Michelin campaign where you had an image of, um, of a Michelin tire and a little diapered baby sitting sure. in the tire? Okay. Mm-hmm. Remember that image? Okay. Oh, yeah. That is a story. And it goes like this. I'm driving down the highway in foul weather one night with my family in the back seat. The car in front of me spins out of control. I swerve around it. And thanks to my Michelin tires, I managed to get around this, this, this accident and get my uh, safely to the other side. And I saved my family's life. That's the story implied in the baby in the tire. Mm -hmm. That's the story that goes through a person's mind when they look at that image of a baby in a tire. I mean, what does that baby in a tire mean? It means that this tire, under the worst circumstances, will protect your family and you will be the hero of that. There's a moral in it. There's a moral of, to the story. Is there a moral in it's every a, story we tell? A moral is a, is a lousy word. Okay. Is there a Me- truth, a universal it, truth? There's a meaning. Mm-hmm. There's a meaning. Uh, truth is too big a word. Moral is too trivial. There's a meaning. <laughs> it, has, it makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. Right, And it makes a, 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 a meaningful emotional sense. I go from the negative, my family in jeopardy, we're all going to die, to the positive, I save my family's life and we come out on the other side safely. And so it has a great dynamic movement from negative to positive, and that negative to positive movement uh, grabs people's emotions and it gives them an idea, if I buy Michelins, I'll, have, I'll be on the safe side of mm-hmm. things in emergencies like that. And so it moves people. It's a purpose told Im- story implied in that image to purchase Michelin's, which I happen to have on my car. So and um, if, if I drink Red Bull, then I can go out and do a backflip on my snowmobile. Here's the Red Bull. Do you remember? <laughs> it, it's much like, do you remember the, um, remember the Nike uh, 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 just do it? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, that's just a phrase, but there's a story. It's just an implicit story. I am a fat, out of shape couch potato um, sitting there endlessly watching, you know, mindless TV. Um, I decide to get myself a pair of Nikes. Um, I start to jog. It hurts like hell. I'm, you know, tempted to give up, but I persevere. And then I'm running five Ks and ten Ks. I'm losing weight. I'm getting in shape. And at the end of it, I come out uh, the healthy, good-looking, happy guy that I've always wanted to be. That's the whole story inside of Just Do It. So what does um, uh, Red Bull say? It says you're a coward. You've never taken a chance in your life. For, you know, couch potato as well. Um, it's time for you to join in the greatest um, excitement imaginable and take, um, get yourself in shape and take on um, high risk adventures like, you know, snowboard, snowboarding or whatever, uh, or hang gliding, etc. And, uh, and you, you get up on that precipice and you look down and you wet your pants scared, but you open your arms you take wings and you fly <laughs> and, and it's the, the greatest experience of your life and so once again it goes from negative you coward who's never done anything in your life and don't know what 
the, 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 the great adrenaline rushes are like. And you find the courage and you jump off a cliff and it'll be the best best thing that ever happened to you. Well, you first find the courage. You put the vodka in the Red Bull. You start there. Then you jump <laughs> off the cliff. So well, we, we help me understand, Robert, why, you know, whenever I ask anybody, you know, who are the best brand storytellers out there? You know, four or five always bubble up. Red Bull, just you know, to your point, yeah. Apple is always in the mix. Nike is certainly there. Mm-hmm. How come there are so few really good brand that tell stories or, you know, really good storytelling uh, brands, I should say. Well, uh, not, not to be too reductive. There's a lot of reasons for this, but the principal underlying reason the businesses fail to tell compelling stories that really put them in the market with success is what I call negaphobia. It's the fear of all things negative. And in order for a story to have a positive ending that will motivate people to a positive, profitable action, the story must have a negative floor. A positive ending without any negative preceding it has no impact. Mm -hmm. If you simply go nice, 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 positive, positive, positive. (laughs) Pollyanna, Pollyanna, Pollyanna. Pollyanna, Pollyanna. People yawn, it's boring, and they don't believe it. They fundamentally don't believe it. And as a result, your positive ending has no effect. A thing is what it is by comparing it to what it is not. A black dot on a white screen is black because of all the white that surrounds it. A white dot on a black canvas is white because of what it is not, all the black that surrounds it. A thing is a thing because it's in contrast to everything it is not. Therefore, a positive ending is is positive when we realize it's not negative. So you have to start a story at some point, at least once, with a negative floor so that there's a movement from negative to positive. And, and that positive ending then has real impact because it's not negative. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. And you teach this to a great extent in your story um, lecture, your story workshop, because I recall when you're talking about writing scenes, that a scene either has to go from positive to negative or negative to positive. For the yeah. most part, you have to take part. somebody through a scene. And so it seems like that plays through in a brand story as well. The only thing that interests the human mind is change. If nothing is changing in the room, if the temperature is the same and the light is the same and the air is the same, and blah di da If everything is the same, uh, you're, you daydream. But if the temperature should suddenly change, if the lights go out, if something changes, then you pay attention. What the hell is that? Okay. <laughs> you, you, the, the mind. Is yep. The mind is the mind is geared to filter out everything that is remaining the same because there's no danger in that. The status quo has no danger. Therefore, there's no point in paying attention to it. And the mind for millions of years, since you know, long before we were human, is geared to noise, to a flash of light, to a movement, to something that changes. That's what gets your attention. And so in a, in a story, it gets and holds attention by dynamically changing. Positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, in a progression, this constant dynamic of change holds people's attention, builds suspense, and raises a question in their mind, how will this turn out? But if it's positive, 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 there's no question. There's no change. There's no interest. Uh, And so, but the problem with people in business is, as I said, a story has to have a negative floor. Red Bull says you're a a, a lazy ass coward. <laughs> Nike says you're a fat ass couch potato. Okay. Um, uh, Michelin says your family's in danger. 
they all have a negative floor from which they then move to the positive. And as a result, people get involved, people um, uh, are moved uh, to make uh, uh, purchases in this case. But you have to have that negative floor. And business people are trained never to say anything, never to hint at anything, never to imply anything negative. Right. It must be right. positive, positive, positive. And this is foolhardy. I mean, this is really stupid, I have to say. This is really stupid. Not to understand that life is the movement. From negative to positive, back to negative to positive. Life is dynamic. It's not static. Yeah. And I read another one uh, point that really stands out in my mind when you were teaching on, on screenwriting is how our protagonist or ourselves, the heroes of this journey, whatever, want something, they go after it, and then the universe pushes back. And you go, uh-oh, okay, that doesn't work. The big pivot happens and then try something again, yes. and, and the universe pushes back. I think businesses don't like to talk about when conflict. the universe pushes back and that yeah. conflict and that pivot. They like to say, oh, yeah, now we figured this out, and, man, we're great, and here we go. Well, that's part and parcel with, uh, with negativist, neg uh, negophobia because if you're at the negative, if you have a problem, in order to solve the problem to the positive – uh, you will have to move against the forces of antagonism that would keep you from achieving the positive, and that generates conflict. And once again, uh, business mind is risk averse. There can be mm -hmm. no conflict. Um, everything is um, all problems are being solved as we speak. Everything is positive, and there is no friction. Uh, and so, aversion to the negative, aversion to friction or risk. Um, is uh, is built into your uh, brains in the business school, never to expose to the public that there's any problems, any conflicts, anything negative within the company. Mm. Uh, anything negative, problematic, um, implied by the, uh, the product. But the product is the solution to a problem, right? Absolutely. I mean, right? Mm -hmm. And so why are we not announcing the, the problem? And, um, and, you know, on a, a decent commercial, you know, Mr. Clean implies, if not shows, you have a dirty house. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Clean, you know, will tidy it up and sanify it. And, um, and so, um, anyway, those are, the, those, yeah. are, those are rote, rock bottom fundamental principles. And it's difficult at times, but I succeed. And convincing business people that they have to change their way of thinking, uh, change their logic from induction to causality. You've got to mix their data into the events within a story. They've got to learn to be dynamic, move through conflict, positive to negative, to end on a positive that will have meaning. Um, and the good ones get it, and they do. And uh, the effects are, uh, the results are great for them. So when we come back from this break, and as you know, I'm a big believer in what you teach and what Hollywood knows that we need to know in the world of persuasion to be better at storytelling, I wrote down my 10 favorite lines from your story workshop back from 2010. And what I'd like to do is go through a couple of them and have you connect the dots for us. Here's what you told screenwriters in that audience that day. And how does that line relate to us business people? So if you're, if you're game for that little, uh, little survey, yeah. we'll do that right after these messages. Hey, if you like what you're hearing here on Business of Story, then you are going to love Definitive, the email from Convince and Convert that many marketers say is the most useful resource around. Each day, the team at Convince and Convert picks a topic and sends you the three best resources ever created about that topic. It's topical, it's timely, it's useful, so go to definitivedigest.com and subscribe for free right now. To tell effective business stories means to truly understand your audience, beckon them in with a story they care about, convert them into a customer, and then nurture that relationship for lifelong brand bonding. That's not always easy to do, but marketing automation has made it easier than ever. The challenge is, how do you take all that data and turn it into drama? 
Well, the marketing gods over at Oracle Marketing Cloud have done that for us. They've created this easy to read and easy to digest guide called Marketing Automation Simplified Guide. It offers an introduction to the five tenets of modern marketing and breaks down the tips marketers need to know to automate and optimize. This includes data in targeting, email marketing, lead nurturing, lead scoring, content marketing, and sales enablement. So to get your free Oracle Marketing Cloud Guide, Marketing Automation Simplified, go to bit.ly forward slash Oracle Automation. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Oracle Automation and start getting your brand story straight. Welcome back to Business of Story and our guest today, the legendary screenwriting coach and coacher of business storytellers, Robert McKee. Now, Robert, as I mentioned, uh, having attended both of your Storynomics course and your Story course for screenwriters, I just love the connection between Hollywood and business and how we can all learn from Hollywood and, and the great masters like yourself um, where we can apply this in our own lives in both professional and personal pursuits to get better at getting people to connect with us on an emotional level, to get them to, quote unquote, buy into our story for all the right reasons, and then to get them to come along and help us in our journeys as we move forward. And I do know that you hate that word journey. I remember that. From, <laughs> it's a euphemism yes. because life, by the way, is not a journey. It's just hell for the most part. And we're always trying to figure out how we're going to get through it. But like I mentioned, I wrote down some of your great lines, and uh, let's just grab a couple of them and let me know how they relate to us business folks. So one of them, the very first one, my favorite one, is story is about trying to make sense out of the confusion, chaos, and terror of being human. Yeah, story is um, an evolutionary adaptation to consciousness. Uh, when the human beings first became conscious um, of themselves. Uh, when the when human beings were able to step back in their mind and think the thought, I exist, I am, um, that was a terrifying experience um, because they, they immediately they became aware that, I, yes, I am today, but someday I will not be. And so living, uh, floating down the river of time, knowing that your time in time will end is, uh, is terrifying. And, uh, and the randomness of life and the chaos of, um, of weather and uh, all the forces that would erase you from this world are terrifying. And so the mind learned how to take uh, the, the chaos and build order how to take the meaninglessness of being alive and give it a meaning. Um, they began to create ideas of life after death as they built religions and uh, fortified those with stories. And so uh, storytelling uh, is the way in which the mind works. I mean, there's been uh, 40 years now of uh, neuroscience studying carefully how the mind works and the key that scientists understand the key to thought, to human thought, is story. <clears throat> story is the organizing principle of thought. And, and it is why I said that the deductive um, or uh, inductive logic of a rhetoric is not the way the mind thinks. Uh, you can prove a point scientifically like that, fine, but it is, is not the natural way the mind uh, absorbs uh, information and puts it into uh, into memory. <clears throat> memory is a story. The future is an anticipated story. And so understanding the, the, the story-making function of the brain and how it brings us into alignment with reality, when you speak to people in story form, you're communicating to people at their most fundamental level. Uh, and as a result, the effects are are much much more powerful, um, but in teaching business people, I I I want them. You see, you keep how oh, you keep wanting to draw the analogy between Hollywood and business. Hollywood business, and of course, it's interesting. Well, it may be, but it could be. It could also be misleading. Okay. Yes, there's a story form in communication in, at the heart of both of them, but Hollywood is fiction. We make these stories up out of our imaginations. 
Business is faction. In business, we don't in, make things up, or if we, <laughs> if we, <laughs> most of the time, most of the time, in business, we're trying to put facts into a form that will be the most effective communication possible and persuade people to to think the way we need them to think and act the way we need them to act, and and therefore, business stories are fact based. They're built out of what indeed is real, and we organize it the way the mind, as I said, by nature does in order to shape it into a a meaningful emotional experience rooted in fact, And, uh, and that's a critical distinction. So at the heart of it, the form of the story structure of fiction and fact are the same, but the content is quite different. But isn't it fair to say we are conditioned by Hollywood and the stories that we see in Hollywood? Well, before there conditioned was, because of the structures of stories and uh, how they work. It's how we like to digest information. So uh, that should play yeah, over but, the business world. Uh, yes, of course. But long before there was Hollywood, there was the theater. And there were novels. And there were the stories our mothers told, her, told us on her knee. I mean, storytelling is storytelling since, you know, as I said, sure. since the first mind. And so... Um, uh, Hollywood storytelling is uh, is a very you know widespread popular, um, but you see I, I have problems with this how because Hollywood frankly is tainted. The notion of Hollywood is tainted in people's minds with bullshit, and business people cannot afford this. You can't be thinking that you can Hollywoodize your storytelling in some fashion. And that this will be effective business, and so do you understand what I mean? I just I totally do it. I just the yeah, word yeah. Hollywood is tainted with bullshit. Let me take away and, the and, stigma of Hollywood, but it goes back to me, I guess, in basic story structure and what you teach in, in your screenwriting courses. You're not teaching bullshit. You are teaching true story structure that we know that the mind loves, and it's you know, essentially all the same story, different characters. And that leads me to my next question when you said you need, and again, speaking to screenwriters, you said you need to understand your characters in a godlike way. And to me, in business, that means you have to understand your audiences, your customers, your employees, your shareholders yeah. in that same godlike way to understand what truthful story to tell them that's going to connect. Yeah, there's, there's no point in trying to tell a story if you don't have anything to say. Mm-hmm. I mean, your story should contain knowledge that the listener does not have. And so there, there should be a revelation. There should be some uh, some information, some some uh, insight in your story so that as the uh, audience is receiving the story, your client is receiving the story, their eyes are opening and they're getting uh, an insight into a world or aspects of things that they didn't know before you started to tell the story. The story has real content. Um, and, uh, and that is, you know, it's, as I said, a story is a meaningful emotional experience. It's a combination of both meaning and emotion, or it's, it's meaning wrapped in a, um, in a moving experience. Uh, and so, yeah, you have to have knowledge. You have to know what you're talking about. Superior knowledge. Um, a great leader, a great corporate leader, a great, you know, somebody sitting in a CXO office uh, a great marketing, you know, CMO um, would have, I would hope, you know, godlike knowledge of the product, the market, and every aspect of it, in order to guide the the future of their company. A CEO, of course, has to oversee it all, and so they they all need to have a, a tremendous in depth knowledge. But the, if you've got knowledge, fine, but. If, if if you can't get it out of your head and into other people's heads in a way that will be positive in its effect on them and and get them to cooperate, to, to work as teams, to develop um, uh, the, the, their projects uh, progressively, if, you, if you've got knowledge and you can't uh, get it into a form that gets people to work, take, uh, for example, uh, uh, Peter Loescher. Um, you know, he was famous CEO, the biggest German corporation. 
and he was fired for that very reason. They, they, the criticism of Peter Loescher was that he had no story. He, no one knew where Loescher was taking the company. And so they were, they were frightened because he had, they, he, he, they didn't have a, he didn't have a story. And all business strategy is a story. When you compose a strategy for your business and you sit around with your team and work together to, to, to develop this strategy, what are you doing? You're telling a hypothetical story. We're going to do this, and if this happens, then we'll have plan B, and if that happens, then we have plan C, and here's our strategy. The strategy is a dynamic story that goes into the future. And so Peter Loescher had no story, but maybe he did. Maybe he had a fantastic vision. It's his problem was he couldn't tell his story. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the investors and the and the the, the uh, rank and file of, um, of Siemens felt abandoned, and they fired him for that. And so, and so, yes, you have to have knowledge, godlike knowledge. You know what you're talking about, but knowledge without being able to express it effectively is worthless. Well, it leads to my final quote from you beautifully. And you said in the story seminar several years ago, and I'm sure you probably say this time and again because it makes so much sense, the key to a great story is to give the audience what they want, but not how they expect it. Yeah, and not how they expect it does not mean cheap surprise. It means um, surprise followed by insight. So as you tell a great business story, Um, you get them to a point where you say, when we tried this, the world reacted in a way we never saw coming. (gasps) Surprise. But then we improvised and we came up with this solution and (gasps) and they get a second rush of insight where they go, oh yeah, that's how that problem is solved. And so, um, and so you give them what they want solutions to their problems uh, but with a moment of surprise when the world reacts in a way they can't see coming and then an insight into how that solution uh, uh, can be put to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when people are surprised and then they get a deep understanding, then they are moved uh, to take the action that you want. Uh, and so um, uh, a story that a business story that does not surprise people where everything happens the way they expect is not a story. It's a, it's a narrative. And a narrative, again, is a very dangerous word, like journey. <laughs> like uh, journey. Yeah, they're euphemisms. Okay, uh, so no more euphemisms. Tell us, where can we learn about Storynomics? And I know you've got some workshops coming up. Where can people find you and attend, and uh, where, where uh, should we send them? Well, uh, I'm going to be doing um, Storynomics uh, twice this spring, um, in New York, in April, um, on the, I believe the 20th of April, so Wednesday, uh, in New York city. And then I'm going to be uh, doing it again in London on uh, May 3rd, uh, in London. And so, um, there are one day and virtually um, working day, nine to five, uh, and they can go to uh, the website, McKeeStory.com. McKeeStory.com. McKeeStory, okay. one word, McKeeStory.com. Uh, click on Storynomics, and, um, and uh, the dates will be there and the venues and all the rest that you need to know to register. And you also have a good email that you send out uh, a couple times a month on Storynomics, too, that yes, you share your insights that I've really enjoyed, I get, and I highly recommend our listeners. And I think you can register for that right there at um, McKeeStory.com as well, right? Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing a new uh, uh, aspect uh, to these, email, these e-blasts. Um, I'm doing what's called Works Doesn't Work. And I'm taking uh, marketing in terms of business. I'm taking marketing pieces and examining them uh, in terms of uh, is this does this work? Is this an effective marketing instrument? Does this uh, piece really uh, move people to um, to take action uh, or not work? 
And um, I just, for example, coming out next week, there will be a a piece like that, uh, which is a doesn't work uh, piece that I did on an Uber mm. uh, uh, a piece of video. And, um, and so um, to try to help business people really get practical understanding of, of why one piece of marketing put out online or even in a commercial on TV, but especially online effect has effect or fails to work. Uh, so I'm doing a, uh, analyses like this every week of a piece of marketing that either works or it doesn't work. And um, I think these will be very helpful. Well, we need to have you come out to Arizona one of these days. As you may know, I teach at uh, Arizona State University a, a class of storytelling around sustainability. And we'd love to have you come out for a day. We have to figure that out. I think we could pack a hall with you talking about storynomics and uh, what it means to business and executives and academia and all of us you know, outside that realm, that story artist realm, I call it, from people like yourself who make a living creating and telling stories. Well, you know, in our line of work, we do make a living creating and telling stories. We just often don't give ourselves permission to tell those stories. Yeah, so. it's, it's risky, but it, it takes courage. It really does. It, it does take courage to tell a story because, you know, when, when, you're, when, you're, when you're doing a PowerPoint presentation, people are silent and thinking their own thoughts and uh, you get a little polite applause. Uh, but when you're telling a story, you're really sticking your neck out. And that's one of the reasons business people resist it is because as I said, it risks, it, it's a risky thing, but well, I, I do, I do come out to LA, uh, twice a year. Uh, so I fly over Arizona. I know you have to parachute in. We'll have to figure that out. We'll figure that out. <laughs> and by the way, that's not a sound effect I put in. I think Robert, you're coming to us from downtown Manhattan and we heard sirens going as you talked about the riskiness of storytelling. So I can't think of a better way to end the show than on that thought with that uh, sound effect behind you. All right. Take care now. <laughs> thank you so much for being with us. And thank you all for listening to another edition of Business of Story. Please come back next week when we have another amazing story artist in our midst to help us all understand how to craft and tell more compelling stories to move people to action. And of course, if you like what you're hearing here, please go to iTunes or Stitcher, give us a rating, uh, leave us a comment. And if there's anything that you would like to hear on the show, or you've got a guest that you'd like to, to connect with, please shoot me a note at park at And until next week, have a wonderful life. Thanks for tuning in to The Business of Story. Don't forget there are terrific free storytelling resources for you at thebusinessofstory.com, where you'll also find the complete show archive. The Business of Story is sponsored by Oracle Marketing Cloud, Emma, Act, and by Convince and & Convert, and is produced by Convince & Convert Media. Find more great shows like The Business of Story at marketingpodcasts.com, the first search engine for marketing podcasts.